This is the future. Examining the abdominal cavity. No colors, no labeling. This is examining what? Upper quad, left quadrant of the abdomen, right? This is examining what? This is the hand, right? This is the upper margin, ziphoid process. This is examining hypogastric region. <clears throat> this is examining right lumbar region. Again, this is examining <clears throat> left hypochondrial region. Which organ do you find in this region? <clears throat> you see, this is the costal margin, right? This is something you know. Now, I am activating your previous knowledge. And the, the hand of this doctor is going deep, deep to the upper left uh, place of this left hypochondrial region. Which organ is deep in the left upper hypochondrial region? Spleen. Okay. Now, all this is old knowledge and we have to reactivate it again this image is telling me that look the hands of this doctor are just inferior to the right subcostal region and this is examination of the edge of the Liver. Again, this is examination of right hypochondrial region uh, trying to palpate the liver. Because we had this previous knowledge and we are going to use it to examine patients. Now, if you are this kind of person, you do not want to hear, you do not want to see, and you do not want to ask, you may leave. Please leave quietly. And go to your father and tell him that whenever I am registered as present, I go out of the lecture. So we'll start to build knowledge of the abdominal cavity. <clears throat> Again, no colors, no labels, but we know where the stomach is. We know where the liver is. We know where the spleen is. We know where is the gallbladder. If we want to test the small intestine, we know where to put our hands. No colors, no labeling. But we are knowledgeable enough to find out our way. The first thing we are going to face is anterior abdominal wall. And anterior abdominal wall has visible landmarks and some landmarks that we know. These two pointers are pointing to what? Old knowledge says this is anterior superior iliac spine. <clears throat> this is what? This is xiphoid process. We can feel it. And <clears throat> this is Costal margin. 
Do you know which line is this? <laughs> this is the mid-clavicular line. This is already something we know. This is the midline. This is the umbilicus. This is the lateral part of rectus abdominis. And this is what? This is inguinal ligament. We are going to see cases of acute appendicitis. We know <clears throat> already that appendix comes out as a blind little uh, pouch from the cecum. So where is the cecum? This is intertubercular plane. This is the inguinal ligament. And the middle point of the inguinal limit, ligament goes up. We get a triangle. Here is the cecum. This is also old knowledge. The four quadrants, to have an idea about the abdomen, and you see the hands testing the four quadrants. And these are the nine regions, and we should know what region has what. If I say the right lumbar region, I am testing mainly the ascending column. If I want to examine the small intestine, I will go and palpate the epigastric region. And this is just activation of old knowledge. Again, <clears throat> activation of old knowledge. Meaning, which organ is lying where? Surface anatomy of the abdomen. Which organ is this? It's the stomach. Can I palpate the fundus of the stomach? No, because it's covered by ribs and costal cartilages. Okay. Which organ is this? That's the liver. What are these three lines? The position of the diaphragm, because we breathe through the diaphragm. So I expect the liver to move up and down a little bit. Which organ is this green structure? It's the spleen. Now, in this cadaver, the anterior abdominal wall is removed. Now, what do I see? I see that the abdominal cavity is full of structures. It is not empty. There is no space. Things have <clears throat> their own specific place and it is shiny. That means it is covered with peritoneum. This is what I'm going to see in real life. This is reality. You see, when I want to see what's wrong with the liver, uh, I don't open the abdomen of the patient to see the liver. This is very stupid. So I do this <clears throat> corona section CT scan, and it is telling me <coughs> lots about the organs. And it is very simple. What is this? This is the liver. It's a large 
structure occupying the space under the diaphragm, the <clears throat> right hypochondrium, and the edge is along the costal margin, extends to the epigastric region and to the left hypochondrium. Which structure is this? No. This is the spleen. The spleen is to the left of the stomach. This is a structure that has a wall and there is air in it and it is dilated. So this is the stomach. Right? What are these little circles? They are small intestine. And what is this? It is a tube. Okay. I know from the basic definition of the large intestine, the very basic definition of the large intestine, it is dilated part of the small of the tube and it has hostrations, you can see, constrictions and dilatations, and it has gases and feces. It fits this definition. So this is the ascending column. This is real life. This is what I'm going to see in the future. Now, the stomach, sorry, the abdomen is lined with the peritoneum and inflammation of the peritoneum is called peritonitis and it can be fatal and it is very painful and the pain is uh, explained in the mind map that I will put on e-learning. This is typical phase of a case of peritonitis. Typical face. Sunken eyes. Lying in bed with a nasogastric tube. Why should I put a nasogastric tube? Because once there is peritonitis, motility of the gastrointestinal tract is going to stop. as a reaction of the body so that infection will not spread. So the stomach, no contraction, no peristalsis. Small intestine, no peristalsis. And I have to take these fluids out. So I put what is called nasogastric, a tube through the nose, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. Typical case. Hopefully, you should not see this face in your life. <clears throat> now, what is the story of the peritoneum? We start here. <clears throat> this is the body wall, and the red line is the peritoneum, lining the abdominal walls. Therefore, this is parietal peritoneum. And you know what is parietal? Just like parietal pleura, parietal pericardia. The next image is this one. <clears throat> Our focus is going to be here. And when I say here, it is the midline posteriorly. Organs start to develop here. But we have peritoneum. So these organs, when they develop, they take a cover of peritoneum and bulge into the peritoneal cavity. 
Some organs, they develop, but they stay in the posterior abdominal wall, but still covered with the peritoneum. This is called vitro peritoneum, behind the peritoneum. What is going to happen next? What is this image telling me? It is telling me, look, things have developed, but they have changed place and moved around, but they are still covered with peritoneum. This peritoneum covering an organ is called visceral peritoneum. And when these organs rearrange themselves in the abdomen, they go to the right and rotate and <clears throat> they create confined spaces. This image is sagittal and tells me that some organs will develop and take <clears throat> peritoneal cover with them and some organs stay retroperitoneal. <clears throat> and this is the peritoneal cavity. This is a diagram of the abdomen this is posterior, the vertebral column. This is the anterior abdominal wall. And it is full of organs. Let's see what's going to happen here. What is this dark line? The red, which becomes black. It is the peritoneum. We have to resort to embryology to understand what is going to happen. This is posterior, this is anterior, this is the body wall, and this is the midline of the posterior <clears throat> body wall. What is this? Parietal peritoneum. Okay. Lining all the abdominal cavity. Now we come to the midline posteriorly where organs develop and protrude into, into the abdominal cavity. This is the point of protrusion. Now this parietal peritoneum is going to be taken by the organ to cover the organ. This peritoneum, the red <coughs> lunar figure, this is visceral, right? Because it covers an organ. <coughs> And the, per the peritoneum is going to return back to the body wall. Now, this structure here, which is called a mesentery, equals what? If we write an equation, mathematics. What is a mesentery? A mesentery is two layers of peritoneum, okay, plus coming from posterior body wall, plus covering an organ, plus coming back, plus 
the point where it leaves the posterior abdominal wall here and comes back it's called the root of the mesentery okay now this is space between this part of the peritoneum and this part of the peritoneum is going to have arteries supplying this organ and veins draining this organ and lymphatics draining this organ right so now we know what's parietal what's visceral what is a mesentery and what is a root of a mesentery <clears throat> then there's this story this is a mesentery pointed at by the black line and here is an organ covered now so that's the mesentery and the story is that this organ this organ is going to give rise to this organ it's in the abdomen it must be covered by peritoneum but these two layers of the peritoneum are not coming from posterior abdominal wall they are coming from the peritoneal the visceral peritoneum covering the origin null organ I am not going to call it a mesentery. I am going to call it an omentum. Right? So what's the difference between a mesentery and an omentum? Both of them double layer of peritoneum. But a mesentery coming from the posterior abdominal wall. An omentum is not coming from posterior abdominal wall. It is coming from the organ that gave the second order, the second organ uh, origin. Then, organs get larger. Intestine gets longer. Things develop and things have to be rearranged so this organ which is the stomach it has it was in the middle and it has to be rearranged in position so it moves to the left and then to the right and it gives origin to covering of the liver. The liver develops from the epithelium of the duodenum, not the stomach. Something will come to later on. So by definition, this is a mesentery. And by definition, this is what? An omentum, because it's between two organs and when it turns around and rotates it creates a space behind it and this is the the rest of the peritoneal cavity which is called the greater sac this space behind the stomach is the lesser sac so organs move and rearrange position you know why because <clears throat> they get larger they get longer and require to be in proper place the result of rearrangement is this space 
this is space. This is space. <clears throat> this is the original two layers of peritoneum when things, when all things were in the midline. And this is called falciform ligaments. The result is confined spaces. Why should I get confined spaces in the abdominal cavity? Because of movement of structures. This is a cadaveric image where you can see that when everything was arranged, then it's covered by an apron. This is called greater omentum. We will come to the story of the greater omentum. This is the stomach, and this is the liver, this is the gallbladder, and this green structure is two layers of peritoneum between the stomach and liver. Okay? It is this, this one here, and it is called the lesser omentum. Let's resort to figures. This is the peritoneum of the posterior abdominal wall. Okay, some organs remain plastered to the posterior abdominal wall, and they are called retroperitoneal, like pancreas, duodenum kidney, aorta, no, not with sleep. And these are called retroperitoneal. Now, can I see a real peritoneum? Here it is. It's a definite membrane Different structure. This is an opened abdomen, upper part of the abdomen, and you can see this is a liver, which is a bad liver. Here is the stomach, here is the diaphragm, and this is the parietal peritoneum. This is the falciform ligament. Because when things develop in the middle, right, it was connected from posterior to anterior. Then things move, but that attachment stays only in the upper part of the abdomen. That's the falciform ligament. This is histology of the peritoneum. It's made of mesothelial cells. They like simple squamous cells. These are nuclei of mesothelial cells and some loose areolar connective tissue underneath the epithelium. This is the higher power. Now, because this and the, this loose and the loose tissue under the the mesothelial cells contains blood vessels, and the peritoneum secretes little amount of fluid to lubricate the organs. Now, <clears throat> the peritoneum around abdominal organs is also called serosa, serous membrane. The peritoneum is a single layer of Latin cells, they are mesothelial cells. What are the single layer of flattened cells called? 
mesothelial cells. They lie over loose areolar tissue, which has rich network of capillaries. Why should I have rich ne network of capillaries? Because I want to secrete serous fluid. The capillaries are vascular and lymphatics. That's quietly and all in one group. Okay, hurry up. And nerve endings. The question here is, is inflammation of the peritoneum painful? The answer is yes and very. Because it has lots of nerve endings. And it has immune competent cells. The parietal fluid is less than 50 milliliters. So if the abdominal cavity is containing more and it is full, there is underlying pathology. The peritoneum is a serous membrane. Why serous? Because it lines a closed cavity. It is the largest serous membrane. What are the other serous membranes? The pleura, and the pericard, serous pericardium. What am I going to write here? Most complex. Why most complex? Because the organs it covers are going to move. They are going to make ligaments and omenta. So it's the most complex. Now, serous membrane, it is going to line abdominal cavity, abdominal walls, all of them, diaphragm posterior and anterior. It also lines the pelvic cavity, the walls. All of this is what? parietal peritoneum. What covers the diaphragm, the anterolateral abdominal wall, posterior wall, the pelvis, is, it is parietal. It's not covering an organ. Now, in, in places, it leaves posterior abdominal wall. And the diaphragm, and the pelvic floor. It leaves these places and cover an organ. Therefore, this is what? Visceral peritoneum. <clears throat> now, peritoneal features, the peritoneal lining the abdominal cavity has pouches the greater sac and the lesser sac. It has recesses, little spaces here and there, like around the duodenum and the cecum and the sigmoid colon. It has spaces 
like subphrenic spaces, spaces between the diaphragm and the liver. And it has gutters, like paracolic gutters. Now we know this fact. Organs move and rearrange position. Therefore, the peritoneal cavity is divided incompletely into compartments. Incomplete compartments, never complete compartments. And it is divided by the mesenteric attachment. So if we read it the other way around, we say mesenteric attachments, and we know what is the mesenteric attachment. It's the root of the mesentery, the place where the two parietal layers come together, make a double layer, and then cover an organ. Mesenteric attachments are, are a way of dividing the peritoneal cavity. Now, we're going to see how the peritoneal cavity is divided. In this image, we can see that this is transverse column. It has a mesentery. Mesocolon. So it roots, its root has double layer of peritoneum. It was in the middle, but rearrangement, rearrangement makes it almost horizontal. So we have simple classification, what is supra mesocolic compartments and infra colic compartments. So we start with mesentery of transverse column. Here is a space, a long space, lateral to the ascending colon between it and the abdominal wall. Therefore, this is a gutter, this sac. And a gutter is present here. Now, why am I showing you this gutter? Because I'll go to the definition or the fact that no compartment is closed, right? So the supracolic and the infracolic compartments are not closed. They are in connection with the other with the rest of the peritoneal cavity on the sides on the right and on the left, by the gutters. So this is a connection lateral to the ascending colon and connecting perihepatic spaces to the pelvis. Now, we need to write what we have seen. Transverse colon mesentery attaches the transverse colon to what? To the retroperitoneal edge of pancreas. The pancreas is retroperitoneal and forms part of the lesser sac and contains middle colic vessels. When I, I showed you 
how the mesentery develops from the midline posteriorly. Between the two layers, arteries and veins come and supply the oil. Right? Now the mesocolon is supplied by the middle colic vessels and divides the peritoneal cavity into supracolic and infracolic. The peritoneal cavity is divided by the transverse mesocolon to supracolic compartment and infracolic compartment. The supracolic compartment <clears throat> contains spaces around the liver and spaces underneath the diaphragm <clears throat> and the lesser sac. While the infra <clears throat> colic compartment contains the infracolic spaces and the paracolic spaces. Abdominal cavity <clears throat> peritoneum is divided by transverse mesocolon into compartments supracolic infracolic supracolic <clears throat> under diaphragm around the liver and the lesser sac okay i have to repeat it so that you you get it very well superior and inferior portions of the peritoneal cavity communicate through right and left paracolic gutter. Okay. These gutters, they connect supracolic and infracolic. So that's the story of the first compartments. This is what, this is a small intestine. And you can see that this is the mesentery of the small intestine. And we can see the vessels coming from the root of the small intestine, supplying the tube. This is the small intestine filling the abdominal cavity. And the green colored structure is the mesentery. Now, the transverse colon mesentery was transverse, or a little bit oblique. Now we want to see the root of small intestine. It starts from the last part of the duodenum. This colored part is the duodenum. So it starts from here. Duodeno jejunal flexure. Duodenum is retrograde. It has no mesentery. And the iliocecal junction, the cecum usually has no mesentery. Now I have added the word usually because sometimes it does. <coughs> And I have to draw two lines between these two points. This is the root of mesentery of the small intestine. This is the real life situation. Coronal CT scan. This is the small intestine. There's no air in the lumen. And here are the blood vessels. And the root of the small intestine is oblique this way. Okay. These are, this is the mesentery of the small intestine. And this is the root of the small intestine. extending from 
due di noi general flexure down to the iliocecal valve. Do you know why I put the end of this line at this point? Hmm? Because here, small lumen filled with fluid, no gas. Immediately it changes into larger lumen with gas. So this is the beginning of large intestine. And this is the last part of small intestine. Here is the mesentery of the small intestine with blood vessels and arteries and veins. And here is the root of the small intestine. The sigmoid colon also has a mesentery and this is the root of the small intestine. What structure is this ascending colon? What structure is this root of transverse colon, mesocolon? And this is the beginning of descending colon. And this is the descending colon. This is the mesentery of <clears throat> sigmoid colon. Now we have this compartment and this compartment. This is the right, okay, infracolic compartment. And this is the left infracolic compartment. Now, why should I bother knowing this? It's because if I have, for example, a perforated gastric ulcer, or a duodenal ulcer, or collection of a fluid in the abdomen, where is the fluid going? This is the pancreas, and this is the root of mesocolon. This is supracolic. This is right infracolic, and this is left infracolic compartment. Now, fluid, for some reason, in the supracolic compartment. Now, I need this fluid to come to the pelvis so that I can take it out. It's easier to take it from structures lower down in the pelvic cavity. The fluid is prevented from coming this way by the root of transverse colon. So it's going to go through the right paracolic gutter and ends up in the pelvis. The fluid which collects for some reason in the right infracolic also collects in pelvis, right? The fluid here, for some reason, is also going to go down the left paracolic gutter and ends up in the pelvis. Now, <clears throat> fluid should come through this arrow down to the pelvis. You see the heads of arrows. We do not want fluid to go back. If it goes back, it is going to collect in spaces under the diaphragm and spaces under the liver and the space which we hate very much is between the liver and the right kidney called Morrison's pouch. Because if this fluid coagulates, it's hard to get out.
This is something we have went through. Okay. That's momentum. That's the greater sac. That's falciform. This is something we know. When the stomach rotates, <clears throat> it creates a space behind it. It's called the lesser sac. And there's an opening. <clears throat> that's the stomach. That's the spleen. That's the lesser sac. And the lesser sac is not a closed compartment. There is no closed compartment in the peritoneal cavity. There is a connection between lesser sac and the lesser sac, and it is called a peploic foramen of Winslow. Now, this image is telling me that if I want to go to the lesser sac, it is posterior to the stomach and posterior to lesser omentum. This is a cadaver where the finger is introduced into this foramen because this is the stomach. This is the duodenum because it's green bile. And this is the liver. And this is the lesser omentum. So the finger is now in the, less, in the lesser sac. It's the same situation. This lesser omentum is made really of two parts. It is between the stomach and the liver. This is two layers of peritoneum, the proper lesser omentum, and this is what is called hepato ligament. This is the hepato ligament. This is the hepato ligament, which makes the anterior part of framing of Winslow that goes into the lesser sac. That's the stomach, that's the duodenum, that's the liver. This is the lesser omentum. This is foramen of Winslow. What does it contain? It contains a triad of structures, the biliary passages, the hepatic artery, and most posterior is the portal vein. <clears throat> this is what is the hepatodudinal ligament. You can find it everywhere. Now, we go to real life. This is the stomach. I'm not going to, to be long. This is the stomach, and this is the pancreas, right? And there's a space between the pancreas of the stomach, and this is the lesser sac. Here is the lesser sac. If you lift the stomach, you open the lesser sac and you can see pancreas. Okay. This is a few facts about the lesser sac and its recesses. Then the story of, this is the lesser sac behind the stomach. The greater sac story is this. Okay. Okay.